As we mentioned earlier, we have with us today, if you were in Reno in 2014 at the, uh, the Nugget, the John Spaulding Nugget, uh, we had the privilege of having uh, Patrick Swartz Faber, that right? Patrick, Patrick with us, who did a session on uh, marketing on a shoestring budget. He did a workshop and then a follow up in the next morning with a keynote speech. Uh, as we mentioned before, we felt that we should probably bring him back kind of for a follow up of that, that presentation, but also to kind of help kick off the theme of our convention, which is build a new base, not being receptive to building a new base. So that's going to be his uh, theme and challenge to do today. Uh, would you please welcome Patrick Sports Faber? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's pretty nice to be back here, guys. I mean, I, I uh, this is what I do for a living. So I, I do, last year I did 31 events, and my speaking fees is 95% of my income. So I, I'm, every week I'm in, usually in a different industry, in a different group, in a different place. And it's, I, I don't know that there's a single place that I've ever had a chance to visit where the people are just genuinely as friendly and welcoming as all of you folks. So, I'll tell you what, it's a real possession, is kindness and being part of a group. Uh, I, I think about the two young ladies who are callers who are here. Uh, we ought to speak to those two young ladies and find out what about this is fun for them. Uh, because that's going to determine how we get more people of that age demographic. And the fact is that, that uh, this is not part of my, my presentation yet, but you know, it, it's very interesting. I cover technology trends generally. And by the way, that was a challenge in coming here because when I was here the first time, I spoke about social media. So being invited to come back, I was like, well, I can't cover that the second time, so I had to come up with something new. And meanwhile, I normally cover things like big data and artificial intelligence and blockchain. Uh, who here knows what blockchain is? Oh, look at that. I love it. Okay. For, for those of you who don't, that's great. For those of you who don't, blockchain is the technology underlying Bitcoin, which is that cryptocurrency which you may have heard of, uh, which is a very fascinating place. But the bottom line is, I was thinking, well, I don't know that Square Dance callers are going to have a lot of use for the blockchain content. So I had to kind of think of new, you know, what am I going to cover this time around? Um, but I really think what we're trying to do here is attract younger blood and people to see what we have here, what you have here. And even just you know, sitting in the back, and, and we'll, we'll get to this in just 20 minutes from now, but seeing the, the way you, you, you recognize each other, I mean, the recognition in the first hour, it's unbelievable. Uh, and it feels good. The, the, those of you who have, like the, the three gentlemen who have been to every single uh, conference for 44 years, and, and these gentlemen are getting recognized every year. It feels good. Who, who are those? Those? those yeah, it feels good to come here every year and be recognized. This has become it's become a part of your life, right? But but it's true what he says. It's true what he says. It's overly simplistic, right? But but it's very true. Uh, the simplicity is deceptive. It's become a part of his life, and I think for probably many of you, it's become a part of your life. So how do we translate that into the other folks? Uh, in your locality and in your region and in your clubs and your classes and the things that you're a part of. And that's what I'm going to try uh, to address with you this morning. But the other thing I have to say here, I mean, boy, is it ever humbling to hear where the source of the funds came from uh, to pay for someone like me to, to come uh, with Vicki Henschel and, and her husband, Dick, who passed. It's very humbling, and I just want to acknowledge uh, her and him and all of you for, for sharing that. It's, <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. I'm going to channel Dick here. I hope. So, um, all right, build the base uh, now. So, um, here's last time I, I, I shared this graph, uh, which was the search traffic for square dance and square dancing since 2004. And unfortunately, it's going down. Uh, and it's down quite a bit over the last 13 years. Uh, but if you zoom in, you see right here on the, you see right there on the right-hand side, over here? 
uh, there is a little bump here, and I know that, that sounds small, but you've got to look at this. If you zoom in a little bit, there is a legitimate pop here in the last few months. So and I don't know what you're doing, okay? I mean, you guys know better than me. And, and by the way, that's, that's kind of a, a baseline disclaimer, which I want to volunteer. It, it's, you know, this is, I go to a different industry every, every week, quite often. I, I can't be an expert, and I certainly don't pretend to be an expert in your field. You guys are the experts in your field. Uh, so what, what someone like me, what I can do, that there's this concept called institutional blindness. It's actually really fascinating research, and it says that when you're in a given organization or a given company or a given activity, for as little as three weeks, you start having blind spots of things that are happening outside. Uh, because you're focused on what you're doing, right? It's a natural thing. There's nothing bad about it. It's a natural thing. But that's precisely the value of having someone like me. This has nothing to do with me, but just someone who's outside of your space to come in and chat about some of these things and maybe bring some fresh ideas because that's going to help the ideas come to all of you. Right? The ideas of how to maintain this community and how to grow this community are going to come from the people in this room. Uh, and hopefully, as we go through some of the things that I'm going to share, and not just me, but others as well, we can learn from each other uh, as well, of course. Uh, and, and in fact, let me just ask that question quickly. Who here is, is part of a community where in your local area, it is growing? You have more people attending on a regular basis right now. Look at this. Now, keep your hands up for a second. Guys, look around and see who you know here, okay? Because these folks are doing it right. And in fact, does anyone want to volunteer just to shout out, like, what's the primary reason it's going well? If you had to boil it down to one thing that you're doing well, what were some of the, what, what's, what's happening in these clubs? Making it fun. Making it fun. Okay, absolutely. Uh, what else? Getting younger people. Getting younger people. How are you doing that? Is there any specific channel? I mean, have you been using social media, for example? Actually, the grandparents are bringing their grandchildren. You know, that, <laughs> guys, that is a legitimate source. Right? There's nothing wrong with that source. Like, let's not put one above the other. Um, yes. Meetup. Meetup.com. I'm a big fan of Meetup.com. Anyone else? See, gosh, say that one more time. We run two mainstream classes a year, 18, triple blind, or crazy, so you can't walk back. Wow, that, that's just, I mean, that just went way over my head. But if you guys know what he's saying, no. do that. <laughs> so let's, far away, absolutely. Well, I really paid a lot of attention to your last presentation, and we have special, we say special people, but the, large, the larger cities, Dallas, Houston, LA, Chicago, Detroit, uh, New York, because the attention span of, of our audience is quite short, and they got too many things to do. And the more sports teams you got, the less time they have. So my particular club is not had a class for three years because you couldn't gather enough. So after your little talk the last time, I went to our club president, and we did nothing but social media. And we put three squares on the board. It's not huge, but that's three squares more than we've had in the past. Strictly for beat up, make up. <laughs> beforehand, my apologies. Thank you, sir. So what he said is that he was actually, they did nothing but social media. And I, I spoke with him briefly uh, yesterday in the, in the atrium, and he said that it didn't come from one place, but that there, was, there was a lady in your, in your club that was very good at it, wasn't there? Yes. And she got on all sorts of things, including Meetup and Facebook and, and Twitter. And what, she, what they found is that if you get a few people in each. Like, there's no silver bullet, guys. There's, nothing, there's not one thing that you're going to do where you're going to have 25 people show up. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. But it's, you know, it's like these exotic cars. They put like 16 layers of transparent paint on the top to make it glossy. Right? It, you layer. That's what marketing is. You layer it. You put it here. You put it there. You put it here. You put it there. And it tickles people. And they notice it. And they see it. And they're like, gosh, maybe that would be fun. And it's, it's, the, it's the repetition where all of a sudden one day, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Tuesday night, and they don't have anything to do. And they're like, you know what, maybe I'm going to do it this week. And, and so anyway, this worked for them, and of course I was thrilled uh, to hear that. Uh, but but it's, it's things that all of you can do as well. So, so I'm going to do something a little bit uh, unconventional here, I think. But I'm going to start off with uh, just this basic concept, and I want your help here. 
uh, we'll just do it quickly so the participation will be pretty short, but what is leadership? Like, I mean, you look at all these things, is this leadership, is this leadership, is this leadership, right? I mean, what is, there's so many different conceptions of leadership. So what is leadership, right? What, what just throw some things out here. Doing the right thing. I'm just going to put the right thing. What was the other one? Respect. I'm sorry. Giving guidance. Giving guidance, absolutely. Vision. Vision, thank you very much. I love it. What else? Being fun. Being fun? Kind. Kind. Gosh, I love kind. this. Absolutely, absolutely. Listening. Listening. I'm going to almost put that beside kind. Providing an example. Providing being an example. I got room for one more. Helping. Helping, absolutely. And let me just uh, label this because I'm going to do the second one. So this one is leadership. Guys, I know that if you're in the back of the room, you probably can't read this so much. And it's okay. The exercise is to try and get to, to get to, to think, right? To stimulate. What are these qualities that leaders, that leaders have, right? And I'm going to circle back to it. And the second one is, uh, who do you find most inspiring? Right, and here's just you know, some names, famous names. And you might, like, my point is, think about one person that inspires you. I don't care who it is, right? But think about someone who inspires you. So here's the second question. Why are they so inspiring? All right, fire away. Upbeat attitude. Upbeat. And attitude, I'm gonna put that here. Perseverance. Perseverance, that's awesome. Breaking new ground. Breaking new ground. Uh, success, absolutely. It's almost like giving an example, right? Being an example, success, very similar. What else? Generosity. Well, I'm just, we'll do it one more time. Generosity. Generosity. Fearless. Fearless. Wow. Wealth of knowledge. Knowledgeable. All right, that's good enough. Charisma. Yeah, yeah it's true. Charisma is a huge one. All right, let me just label this one as well. So we have, a, this is inspiration. All right, thank you guys. Thank you for, for, for volunteering so, so quickly. So the point is that when we look at somebody else, right, like I said, what is leadership? And I provided some examples, external people, right? And then you guys provided all, all of these ideas. And then we talked about who do you find most inspiring, and again, I put some names up, and I, I asked you to think about someone outside of yourself, right, some other person. And it's really easy to think like this when we're thinking about other people, like the clarity, right? We know exactly what it is that makes these people good leaders, right? It's not as easy when we have to look in the mirror and adopt those exact same qualities ourselves. Like you, this is this again. This the simplicity of some of this stuff is deceptive, guys. I, I can't. There's, there's nothing very little I can share with you that you haven't heard before. Right? These ideas are ideas that you've heard your whole life, just like I have. Uh, but what I, what I want to try and get to is is just the clarity of it all. You're all leaders, right? This is a menu, right? Like when you think about it, I just asked a second ago who inspires you the most, and you thought about somebody. So who in your life would think about you when they're asked the same question? Just think about it for a second, right? Like if, who is in a room like this, metaphorically, would put you on their list? Like you all have people. And of course, for many of us, how many of you have children? Most of us are in this So it could be your child, it could be your son, your daughter, it could be grand grandchildren for some of you. Uh, that they look up to you, but think about within the Square Dance community, right? Think about in your local area, in the activities that you do as, as a Square Dance caller, who looks up to you? 
And it might be more than one person. It might be three or four people, five people. Right? You are a leader to them. You are, you are an example to them. Right? They want you to be helping them. Right? That's what they see. That's what they look for. Right? That's what, that's what, all these things, they want you to do the right thing. They want you to provide guidance. They want you to be upbeat. Right? It's, and these are all qualities that we have to learn. You know, they, they talk about leadership and leadership training, and there's a million books on this. I don't know if you have, any of you have read John Maxwell. He's got a whole bunch of books. And anyone read John Maxwell? Just to see a few hands. Yeah, I mean, awesome uh, guy and a man of principle for sure. But he talks about being a leader is not about having a job title where people are forced to follow you. Right? That's power. Leadership is getting people to follow you because they want to follow you. Right? That that's what they want to do. So, and, and there's, there's a, you know, again, most of the events I do are very corporate, and so you have to do this corporate speak and paradigm shift and all these kind of cliches. Um, and coming here, I was like, I'm not going to try and play that game with all of you, just because it's such a different energy, and I think you guys are so real uh, and so kind of transparent in, in, in the issues and the opportunity, both the opportunities and the challenges. So I wanted to take a different approach. And one of the one of the organizations in my life that that you all remind me of, I mean, it's so so much, it's incredible, uh, is Toastmasters. Who, who here has been to a Toastmasters meeting? Look at this. Take a look around, guys. Uh, quite a few people. Uh, does anyone not know what Toastmasters is, honestly? Okay. So Toastmasters is a, a club where you can join. They have literally hundreds of thousands of different chapters, uh, clubs, all around the world. I mean, literally over 180 countries, uh, where you can develop your public speaking skills. So people come in and they, they give speeches. Excuse me. They have a whole a series of manuals. Um, that, that you can do different projects and learn to do different types of speeches and you can practice and so on. And I was, because this is something, like doing what I do, guys, I have the best job in the world. I mean, I, my dream came true. Like I literally, when I was 10 years old, I knew that I wanted to do this type of work. Uh, I used to watch Ronald Reagan on TV. I was, I was born in Canada, I grew up in Canada, but of course Reagan was such a huge figure. And I, I'm 46 years old, I was born in 1971. So, um, he was, and I used to go to church on Sundays, and I used to, to listen to our pastors, and I was always like, man, it was so cool that they were up there, you know, sharing some content and, and being a community and communication. So it's something I wanted to do my whole life. So Toastmasters was a natural fit for me, and I, I, I joined Toastmasters as a member uh, for quite a long time. And every year, uh, July 1st, so in May, we have elections, just like, I mean, going through a very similar process to what, all, what you all were doing in the first hour. Uh, acknowledging all these people who are volunteering at different levels. Well, every year uh, they had a different president. Our club president changed because we elected a new one. And what I found is that some of these presidents, the club would thrive and it would grow and new people would come, right? And there was a good energy and it was just fun, right? And then other people, it wasn't the same. Right? And I look back, there, there was one uh, guy in particular, his name was Scott Lambert. Uh, and in, in, in the time that I was a member of Toastmasters, Scott Lambert, he just did, he did an awesome job. He was just, he was kind, he, he, was, he was these things, right? And as a result of that, the club grew, and it was thriving, and new people were joining. And he wasn't doing anything specifically, but just the energy was better, right? And then uh, two years after Scott, we had uh, another guy who I won't because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not here to, to yeah. Anyway, um, we had Thomas, and Thomas was just not the same. He was uh, uh, angry many times and, and, and really a stickler for. For certain things, and, it, it was, and so the energy completely changed, and, and the club started to not do as well. And you guys, I mean, does this sound true to, to, in your own communities? Right, this happens. Right, this the, the energy of a leader, and we see this everywhere. It's not just in in Toastmasters and Square Dancing. I mean, we see this in companies when they bring in a new CEO. All of a sudden, the energy changes in the entire company, or a, 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 a municipality elects a new mayor, and the energy changes. Or in a different group, someone comes along and kind of assumes a leadership role, and all of a sudden, the group of friends starts to become more vibrant or less so. Right, this is the this is what happens, right? The leader of the organization, at the end of the day, this is a conversation about leadership, and that the impact that you have, 
like it's it's you, right? And there's 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 this a uh, you know it's the personal responsibility of it. To, and I know you do this already, but the, the conscious decision to embrace that role and say, I am going to be a leader for my community of square dance and be an ambassador and be an evangelist and be all of these things. Or if you don't have some of those skills naturally, bring in someone who does and get them to be more involved. But it all boils down to us taking a more active role to say, you know, I am the leader of this group or one of the leaders of this group and people look up to you people watch you it's, it's a, i remember one day when a friend of mine said that to me and it was a totally different circumstance and, and there was nothing about there's nothing self-aggrandizing but it's just the notion that we should all know like there we walk the world people watch us and the more you do to assume a leadership role the more people are watching right so you're all just i mean by by the nature of being squared as callers you're immediately in a leadership role there's a lot of people who wish they could be you up on that stage, right? When you go to these events and all the dancers know your name and you only know 10% of the names because it's not a fair contest. <laughs> and they got one name, right? I know how that feels, right? You have to know one name, right? Patrick, and you don't even have to worry about my last name. Because <laughs> that's not important. I should have run for governor. California. <laughs> That, that uh, whatever it was, the recall election where Arnold uh, went on, I was like, damn, I should be, I mean, I would get votes, right? Because my name is spelled basically the same. It's a few letters different. So I would have been right beside him. They listed all of them alphabetically. So I would have been. Do you know, I mean, this, seriously, you can't even make this stuff up. Do you guys know that Arnold Schwarzenegger has a son named Patrick? Oh my lord. Do you know what that translates into in my life? Like, I get calls all the time because people are looking to book Patrick Sch Schwarzenegger. And I'm like, 5'8", right? Like, like, I'm not a big guy. And of course, those guys are huge. Anyway. So, uh, the point is, this is a conversation about leadership. And that, that's, that's what I want to dig into today. And, and I, I look at not just Toastmasters, but it is an outstanding example, and I'll, you'll know why as, as we go through this. But there's really three things that I see as being critical when you see these organizations, these types of voluntary-based, not a company, not something like that, but these are volunteering. The number of people in this audience who are volunteering to be a part of this community and working, spending time, right? That you get paid for in your regular career, whether you're retired or not or whatever. The bottom line is your time is, is worth money and people are volunteering their time to support this community. So how can we encourage that below us as well into our local communities? And it's, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation about leadership. And the three things that I want to really focus on, uh, I was, someone said uh, being kind, which I just think is awesome because I think the first, the first one is kindness and there's some implications of that that I want to dig into briefly. I, we won't spend too much time on that, but it's an important place to start. Uh, and then the second is structure. And there is value in structure. We will talk about it. That's why I use this image. When I heard that your theme this year was build the base, uh, I was like, boy, I have the perfect slide for it. So we're, we're going to talk about structure, and I think there's a lot that we can learn uh, there. And then finally, I do want to touch on marketing again. And I, I'm not going to do the basic social media I'm going to talk more about kind of a mindset and some ideas, and I'm really, I'm really hopeful that that some of you can can get some ideas for some really fun things. Uh, someone said, "Make it fun." Wasn't there fun in here somewhere? But the whole idea of making it fun, making it an experience, right? That's something that we can we can learn from. And then what's happening in the marketing space is really cool. So let's let's talk about the first one, which is kindness, and, and it boils down to this whole notion of of wanting to help people. Right? As a leader, the, the, this is like the, the golden rule is number one, that people should be wanting to follow you. Right? So you're not forcing anyone to follow you, they're following you because you're, you're, they, want to be, they, they want to follow you. And by the way, people love having that guidance. Like they, people are, you know, the world is a scary place. Like when you're doing something new for the first time, you want someone to play that role. So that having that out there, and having someone in their lives that, that plays that role is, is, uh, is very important. But a good leader, their true nature is to try and get their people to improve. And it's not about improving themselves. Becoming a better leader is by helping all your people improve. 
So this whole idea of helping others uh, is, is a really important concept. Uh, but let me just ask you, because this is an interesting comparison, how many, how many people here have been to Thailand? Okay, just, just a handful of you. Uh, so I've, I've been, I travel a lot uh, with my work, and I do quite a lot of uh, international stuff. So I've been in, in Bangkok a couple of times for these conferences. And for those of you who haven't been, I mean, it, it is, it's incredible. They, they, you know, they're incredibly kind, right? They have this, this incredibly welcoming energy that they, they genuinely want you to be there. Right? These people, it, it's really amazing, and, and I recommend it highly. I mean, Thailand is one of those places where you go there and you feel it. And as soon as you get there, there's a kindness, there's a welcoming energy that you see right away. Well, last December, just a few months ago, um, I got hired to uh, do an event in Vietnam, which is also very beautiful. Right? You know, the, the, the topography, right? Who here has been to Vietnam? Just, just to see a comparison. Yeah. Actually, a similar amount of people. Uh, ha Long Bay, has anyone been to Ha Long Bay? Anyone? It, it, this is a photo of Ha Long Bay, actually. It's, a, it's an incredibly beautiful place. It's like it comes out of a movie. But, but it wasn't the same. And these two countries are, are right, they're, they're right similar. They're, they're the right, same place, right? Uh, but when I was in Vietnam, the folks were not that friendly. They, they, were, they were nice, but it was different. The energy was different. That welcoming energy was not there. And, 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 and when they did things, like in the tours, like I took this tour of Ha Long Bay, we were on this boat, which of course had a staff of, of 15 or whatever of these, these people, you know, the Vietnamese people who were running the show. And, and when they did things that were kind, it was so artificial, it was put on. It didn't feel genuine at all. And I, I, I ended up being friendly with one of the guys who ran that boat, and, and, he, and he spoke excellent English, thank God. Uh, and so I, I spoke to him quite a bit, and he said something to me that I just thought was incredible, because Vietnam and Thailand, they compete. Uh, in, in a number of ways, because they're in the same region, and they, so there's, there's a little bit of friendly competition between the two of them. And he said to me, he said, uh, Thailand does an incredible job. When people go to Thailand, they come back again and again and again. When people go to Vietnam, they go once, and they never come back. And he, he's like, it, it, it's just the efficient, the difference in efficiency is huge, because you've got repeat clients. Right, on the Thailand side, but the Vietnam, and it's because of this energy, right? It's because of that, it's the friendliness. And we, we underestimate that. We, we live in a very tactical world where people are always looking for the, the thing they can do. Like, try this trick, try that. Get on this platform, do it this way. But post something on the, the church newsletter and all these tactics. But I, I wanted to mention this because this is a huge piece and we underestimate its importance. Having a welcoming energy uh, in your group and in your community is a major reason for people to want to come back because they feel good, right? And, and that's really the difference that, that, that we had with, uh, with Scott Lambert and with, with Thomas. Scott Lambert had this incredibly welcoming energy and, and Thomas just, just did not. So my, my thought on this is, before we kind of go on to the next, the next section, which is my favorite section, by the way, um, but on, on this side is think about who in your community has a great social circle to begin with. Like for example, Scott Lambert is incredible. So I live in, in, in Walnut Creek, California. It's about 20 miles east of San Francisco and 10 miles east of San Francisco. So if you're in San Francisco, you take a, a, a bridge to get to Oakland, okay? And then you take a tunnel to get to Walnut Creek. And this is about 20 miles. So, so 10 miles in between me and the city is Oakland. Uh, and, and Oakland has a, a, an Italian men's club called the Colombo Club. It is the biggest men's club west of the Mississippi. The, it is unbelievable. So every Thursday, they have a dinner, and it is like 500 Italian men. Okay? Not a single woman in the whole building. Even in the kitchen, the servers, everybody, there is, it's all testosterone. <laughs> And, and, they, and, it, and it, it's an unbelievable thing. So Scott, who's Italian, uh, he has this huge social circle that he does this automatically in his regular life outside of Toastmasters. He coordinates this, and once a month we go to the Colombo Club, and he usually has 20 to 30 people on his table, all coming from one guy, Scott. Why? Because he has that 
that welcoming energy. And, and it's, and by the way, it's hysterical. Like they have raffles at the end where they have dozens of prizes, which are either booze or salami. <laughs> like it's really, it's a fun thing to, to attend. We have a great time. Uh, you drink all these old school drinks, you know, like, uh, like uh, something like uh, Rusty Nail. Any of you guys drink Rusty Nail? Whiskey and Drambuie? Oh my lord. It's, I mean, it's a problem from living long if you arrive. <laughs> But the point is that Scott has this, he does, this is who he is. He is that way. Thomas, who by the way is a very smart guy, he's a very smart guy, but he has almost no friends uh, in his regular life. Now I'm not criticizing anybody, okay? But we need to know as leaders where we are on that scale. Because I have more friends than Thomas, but I have less friends than Scott. So I'm in the middle somewhere. Right? I don't know where, but I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay? And you all individually know where you are on that scale. How social are you? Okay? If you're really social, then you should be the primary one driving the, you know, the VP of membership effectively for your local community to get people, because it's your energy that, that, that does that. But if you don't have that energy, like I have some of it, but I don't have as much of it as, as Scott does, it, it's, it behooves us to find the people in our local community that have that. Like who in your community is just naturally has a ton of friends and stays in touch with everybody? Get that person involved. Get that person involved. And give them responsibilities and they will step up and they will improve the attendance. This is such a simple thing, but it makes a huge difference, right? This idea of kindness. And it's just, I wanted to start there because you know, it lays the foundation. So uh, number two, structure. So I mentioned this three years ago. Uh, and I know it was a very small part uh, of my presentation back then, and that's why I wanted to revisit it, because I believe this so strongly. And it, it boils down to one saying, which is, leaders hate structure, but followers love it. <laughs> leaders hate structure. So let me just explain this briefly, because this is, you know, I, again, the simplicity of these concepts is deceptive. I actually kind of live my life according to this to a large extent. So first off, None of us are all leaders all the time, or all followers all the time. Okay? So some of you go to church, probably. Uh, in that environment, you're a follower. And the pastor is a leader in that community. Right? Many of you have children, you have families, so you're a leader in that capacity. right? And, and your children are followers. At least until they're adults, and sometimes they're <laughs> 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 you know how that goes. <laughs> but and, and then if you're if you're working, then your your followers are the people who report into you for the most part, or essentially follow your lead one way or another. And then you might be a follower to the higher ups that are, uh, that are. So we're all both. Is my point. We're all both. But in this square dance community, you folks are leaders. And that, again, I'm coming back to the same thing: embracing that role. Right? I am a leader. The, the success of my community depends in large part on me. That's what I'm hoping that, that, that you think about. Right? That's the part that I think is important. So let's go back to Toastmasters. Because Toastmasters has more structure than any organization. So let me, so let me say one more thing about the leader follower. When you're a leader, you want to be like, leave me alone. Don't give me rules. I've got this. I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Right. Don't tell me what to do, right? When you're a follower, structure is incredibly important. Like, it, it makes you feel like you understand. It takes, it buys the risk out. It makes you understand what defines progress, what defines excellence, what do I need to do to be good at something, right? All those things are delivered through structure. And you cannot provide enough structure for people who are in a follower capacity. I mean, you can even you can even look at like your lifespan, okay? Like when you're when you're a, a, a young baby, right? You know, the more structure, the better, right? Bed at the same time, eat at the same time, nap at the same time. Like everything is structured. Kids function better in a structured environment. Then we become adults where we're more of a leader capacity, and we're like, leave me alone. I got this, right? And then what happens when you start getting, you know, much older? Like my, my mother, I'll tell you, my mother, uh, who's still alive, but she's, she's, very, she's very sick. Uh, 
and she, uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on there, but anyway, the, she does best in a structured environment again. Like, as soon, for example, when I visit, it actually makes it worse because her, her routine is she has private care and, and a 12 hour a day companionship. She has a very, very heavily, they, they call it, my mother's name is Elizabeth, they call her Queen Elizabeth at the, <laughs> at the place. <laughs> because it's, it's an insane amount of, 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 of care coverage. That she, she's IC3 plus 12 hour a day companionship. So it's, it's her, she gets the best care of the whole facility. But she does well in a structured environment where she gets up at the same time, she goes to bed at the same time. And as soon as I visit, I'm the youngest of four, so we each visit once a year. So she has a visitor once every three months. Uh, and every time we visit, I mean, it, it's nice for her a little bit, maybe for five or ten minutes, but then it, it, it throws her off. Like, she, she doesn't, seriously, I mean, she's, you know, it is what it is, right? We get older. And it, when you get older, things get taken from you, right? But, but you don't know it until you start losing stuff, by the way. But, <laughs> you know, am I right? But you're, I mean, I'm 45. When I was 35, things started happening, right? And, and I'm like, are you joking? Like, you, you don't expect it until it's gone. Anyway, so this has happened. My mother's run that track a lot of times, and so she's, she's lost a few things. So she doesn't really understand. She can't speak much. But you can, she gets very agitated and very frazzled when, uh, when the structure goes away. So the structure is very good. So it, this applies in, in a whole bunch of different places. But in Toastmasters, they have an insane amount of structure, right? And there's, I mean, there's clubs, and there's areas, and there's divisions, and there's districts, and there's, I mean, this goes on, the regions. There's all kinds, and then they have all of these different roles that you can play. These are all different voluntary roles. Guys, these are all voluntary. No one's getting paid. Right, I, I mean, I've competed. I competed in, in, in Toastmasters, and I, I did. You know, I kind of went through a bunch of levels, and there were, I mean, more than a hundred volunteers bringing their time, right, their energy, their positivity, and it reminds me of what you're doing this morning when you're calling out all these people, the board of governors, and this group and that group, and all these people who have contributed. You're you're contributing your time to make this a vibrant community, but how can we get more structure below where you are, right, into your local community? How can you do, do more structure at that level? Like maybe you even have VP of membership, VP of education, VP of, like give people, because people want to have a sense of achievement, right? They want to feel like they've actually contributed. People want to be, who here has read the book Drive? The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. It's by an author called Daniel Pink. It's an excellent book, one person, two, three. Guys, you need to read more. <laughs> <laughs> I go, you know, I travel, right? And I go through books by the dozen, but I don't actually read them. I always listen to them in audio format, which the retention is like 2%. So uh, if you read one book a year, you're probably beating me. But he talks about how money is not uh, a huge motivator. It boils down to autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, autonomy is leave me alone, don't micromanage me. Mastery, people want to be good at what they do. And we're going to talk about that later because I think there's things you guys can do to help people better appreciate if they're an excellent dancer or a good dancer or an average dancer. Uh, I know there's some taboo subjects there about to what extent should we do that, but I think there's value in it. I'm going to come back to it. But, and, and then also uh, purpose, people want to be part of something bigger. The folks that are coming here and contributing, they're contributing because this is part of their life. They want to be part of the community. Their identity, this gentleman's identity, part of his identity is, I'm a member of Caller Lab and I've been to it 45 times. And it's, a, it's part of it. When he looks in the mirror, he sees 45 Caller Labs, among other things, right? <laughs> Caller Lab conventions. Right? It's a, it becomes a part of who you are, and the more you contribute to something, the more you feel a part of it. And we have a we have a shortage of that in our world today. People they're addicted to this Facebook dopamine rush, you know, pretending they have a life that's actually a lot more fun than it is in real life. <laughs> And then what happens? Everyone else is on Facebook looking at all these other people supposedly having the time of their lives and they get depressed and are full of cortisol. So you got like half the population's got to open the other. I mean, it's a disaster, right? But when people are actually involved doing something, it changes your definition of yourself, right? Uh, and I'm not just talking about you. You guys have that already. That's why you're here. The fact that you're here is evidence that you do this. But the people in your community at the local level, think about them. They wanted to play a bigger role in their life, maybe, 
than it is currently, and there's an opportunity uh, to do that. And one of the ways is to incorporate massive structure. Like in Toastmasters, they have a series of manuals. They actually have 10 manuals. Uh, and guys, I think this is a genius thing, that, and I think to some extent you have this, but I think you could do more. Right? These manuals, each one has 10 projects in it. And each project encourages the user to work on a different aspect of public speaking. Right? And so it, you have, you know, make your point and, and speak with your hands and all these different projects. You can, so it allows you to develop different parts of the skill set. So I know you guys have like a 10 week program where you can learn uh, at least the fundamentals of Western Modern Square Dance. I, I know that this exists, okay? I think you should have more. And by the way, I think you should have some that have a lower barrier to entry. Uh, I think this is really important, actually, because it, someone said this earlier that the, the, attention, the, the attention span is just shrinking. It's insane. They, they don't have any attention. And I, 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 there was a gentleman uh, in this area that I spoke with during the break who uh, told me about they have like a program where, where people can come in and in 15 minutes they can learn enough to do a dance and have fun. Right? And again, I'm not, you know, just, just to be super clear, right? I am not an expert in your field. I'm not pretending to be. But I'm hearing this story. Where, where is this gentleman? Yeah, there, there he is. I'm sorry, remind me your name. Carl. Carl, what's your, give me your full name just so everyone knows. Carl Good. Carl Good. Well, Carl Good. Carl Good. Carl Good. Good. Right. I got it wrong twice. Like Daniel, like Daniel. The tall guy in the red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to him, the guy's like, what are you, 6'2", 6'3"? Yeah. I mean, it's not fair. <laughs> like, if I could pay $10,000 to be three inches taller, I would do it that fast. <laughs> anyway. Um, these folks, last night I did my, school, my, my first square dance since grade school. Last night, right back there. Um, and I, I was horrible. <laughs> so those of you who might remember me for three years ago, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a salsa dance. Salsa dancing is a big hobby of mine. I do quite a bit of that. Uh, but it's a very different animal than what you folks are doing here. And, and being in that square with seven other people and going through that and just trying to figure out. But it was fun, right? And it would have been more fun if I had gone through that 15 minutes, which would have allowed me to at least function at that minimum. You know, in business, they call it a minimum viable product. What's the minimum viable product? Right? What is your minimum viable product? It's actually, a, it, I didn't think about bringing that up, but it's a very good metaphor. What is the least amount that you can teach a newbie for that person to have a fun evening? And I, I listen, I know you take pride in the complexity. Right? Like, I, like I have spoken to enough of you. <laughs> like, it's a big deal, right? Like, and you, you know it, like I've heard, I mean, Mary Clasper, bless his heart, tells me it's like 300 different moves, right, that you gotta know. Well, you don't gotta know, but like, that, that are, you can know like, even more than that, right? And, and, and I listen to this, I'm like, this is insane, right? And I get why, the, see, the two go hand in hand. If you have a structure, like, what is excellence? We're gonna come to this in, in, in a little bit, but how do you define excellence? If you have that structure, because you're trying to protect, and I, I, I'm not putting words in your mouth, okay? This is just my interpretation. You guys can toss out whatever I'm saying that's not accurate. But I think there's, there's, there's an instinct to want to protect the complexity because that's your sense of identity. You have mastered something that's complex, right? Like, not everyone can do it. And that's part of the appreciation, I think, is knowing that you've, you've risen to that level, that, that level of expertise. Well, if you have a structure that defines these different levels, that allows you to have a beginner portion without threatening what you love. Does that make sense? Like you, when you have an easy point of entry, but you've got the structure in place, then all of a sudden it's okay, right? Everyone still knows that you're an expert. Everyone still knows that you know 300 plus moves, but you're still incorporating the new people because some of those new people are gonna see what you do and they're going to want to do it too. Not all of them. Maybe it's one in two. Maybe it's one in four. I, maybe it's one in ten. Maybe it's one in ten. But that's still better than zero in ten. 
Like, get, just getting the 10 in there. Like, getting Toastmasters, we, in my club, I had a, I was president too one year. We, we had a good year. It wasn't as good as Scott's, but it was, it was, you know, it was, it was good. It's better than Thomas's. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, we always had guests every week. We, had, we, we probably had 25 to 30 people every week at our meeting, uh, and, and, which is not huge, but it's actually, believe it or not, that's actually a good size for a Toastmasters club. But um, we always had two or three guests in the audience, and of course, you know, they didn't all join. We had about one in three would end up joining um, our club. But the point is, we still had two people that were only there one time, and then they didn't come back. That's okay. Having that new energy is also good as well. Even if the, so, if it's one in ten, I think it's probably better than one in ten. But if it was just one in ten, you got nine people who were never going to come back. Well, at least they're there once. And if, and if we do this right, then maybe you have a different nine next month, uh, or, or the month after, or weekly, or right? you know, however frequently you, you do this kind of stuff. But my point is to provide a menu. Right? To provide a menu of what you do, all the options. People love structure. When they're coming to your, your class or your club or your local event for the first time, they need that structure to feel welcome. It, it, it's, it, it, it makes it less threatening to them. Because they're like, okay, I get it. I have to do step one first and step two second. I can do the minimum. Well, you can give it some catchy name if you want. Uh, I even, when I was, in, years ago, I was in the mortgage business, and I, I created this this thing here. I printed it, and, and people love this, and it, it broke down like all the different types of mortgages that you could have. This is pre-mortgage meltdown, so some of these programs literally don't even exist anymore. But it, it was, and, and this marketing piece that I made, my gosh, people kept that thing forever. They loved it because it gave them structure. It gave them a way to understand something complex. And they could be like, okay, I don't know everything about mortgage, but I know that I'm here, right? There's a lot of value in that. And I think that for the new people that are coming in to your group and trying it for the first time, having something like this uh, goes a long way. So I mentioned before that I, that I do salsa dancing. And I, you know, I started, I had a conversation with somebody else uh, last night about this. I, I've been taking lessons. I took a, a break, but I started taking lessons in year 2000. Uh, and, and, I did take quite a break in the middle, but now I, I really came back in earnest in 2011. Now it's 2017, so it's six, so I've been doing this for a while, and I do not consider myself to be an advanced dancer. Like there's just similar to what you're doing, uh, there is a lot to learn. In, 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 who here has anyone tried salsa? Just, just okay, cool. Salsa is very, very fun. It's a very, very fun uh, dance. Very, I mean, it's it's sexy. And you're, you're, it is. I mean, so I, I sort of was swing, right? And swing, the basic step is is side, side, quick, quick, side, side. It's a three beat, which is always tricky because most of the music is four beat music. But anyway, um, so you always have these correction steps to get back to, to the one. But anyway, salsa is an eight beat count, so that works fine. But in swing, you're going side, side. So you're the woman, you're, you're, you're going side, side. In salsa, like, I'm walking to her and she's walking into I mean it's it's a different energy just as soon as you do that like I remember when I first started I was like holy smoke here we go <laughs> it's dinner time <laughs> anyway so I, I, I the point is it, it, it's quite complex it's a lot of things that you can learn right but I, I take one of the guys that I take lessons from is this guy right here I found this image which I've never seen until like four days ago Salsa with Tomaj, and that's Tomaj right there. Um, and he does this class, he teaches in Arenda in, in the Bay Area uh, and some other places, but he has this one class in Arenda, and it's in what he does, and this is brilliant, and I think you guys should do something similar, is he has a 10 week, or is it eight week? I think it's eight week, actually. Yeah, it's eight weeks. Yeah, it's, it, anyway, it doesn't matter. So he has this program that, that starts, and you, you don't buy, like you, you could buy individual lessons but there's like a massive discount to buy the block of eight because the, the, the idea is and you get this program, you get this menu with all these different things and you're going to learn in eight weeks, you're going to learn uh, and the, the, the men in the room, for anyone who's done partner dancing, will be able to appreciate the value, <laughs> at least I did, in learning to dance an entire song without repeating any patterns. Right? And, and this as a guy, like it's the dynamic's so different. Like the woman I think is is thinking about different things 
you know, like how to do the turns or flares or, you know, she's in a following situation. But for a man, like for me, it's like the freaking matrix, right? It's, it's like, <laughs> I'm running calculations. Like, I mean, it's like an Excel spreadsheet. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, do I have room and how do I do this? So in, in an eight-week program, you're going to learn to dance an entire song. And people love that program because of the structure. And they know that and they stick with it because they want to learn how to do the entire song. And of course, it's, it's cumulative. So every program, every, every week, they're like, okay, last week we did this, and you can do that part of the song. And then this week, we're going to add to it with this other pattern. Right? And that structure, it just gives people a lot, uh, a lot, of, a lot to grab onto. Right? And it keeps, it keeps them involved. So in your field, like, what determines excellence? What is excellence? How do people know when they're excellent at, at square dance? Right? I think you could, I think there's so much potential, and I don't know who's going to create it, because there's some work there, but I think it probably a lot of it already exists. We just have to put it in a, in a, in a cohesive unit, right? But, but having that structure allows people to say, okay, I'm, in the simplest terms, you guys give it better names than this, but okay, I'm a level three dancer. Right? And, and, and that person over there, man, I love the way she dances. She's a level six. Do you know how valuable that would be? Like to have that structure, to know what is required, that's gonna get people more involved and get them more uh, engaged in the process. And these manuals do exactly the same thing. Right? They, they, they give you that structure. Right? By the way, having contests does the same thing. And I know from, uh, Barry's been wonderful, by the way. He's, he spent more than an hour with me on the phone. Uh, we actually had two calls, but the one we, we went into a whole bunch of detail, and he provided articles he'd written and all sorts of stuff, so I'm really grateful for his time. And, and he told me that there is not a taboo, but there's a reluctance to do contests uh, in um, this field. And so I know I'm not the first person who's advocated for this, and, I, and I'm also not in the community. So I, I, But when I, when I say this, just think about the others who have. I think it's worth considering. Uh, to do these contests, and Toastmasters is a great example, they, they have these contests and people, it becomes an event, right? It's an event. You're either at the, it only takes place once. You're either at the contest or you're not, right? That's one thing, which is an incentive to come, right? Just, just have it, we'll talk about that in the marketing section. But the other is, like, it defines what is excellence. And it gives people something to shoot for. It gives people a recognition of saying, I've been at the, at the conference 45 years in a row. It's a point of pride, I think, for these people who have done this, right? And, it, and it's deserved, right? Well, the same thing is true with the contest. Like, I, when I competed in Toastmasters, I, I got up to the, to the regional level, which was, it was a good run for me. I'm proud of that. And I have a way of measuring it because going to the region is better than going to the division. So I know how, how good I did. I don't think you're going to hurt anybody by introducing contests. And it's, again, I, you know, I just know that my role here is only to start that conversation, but I do hope you continue and do whatever you choose, but I think there is value. And the last thing I want to say in the structure side is you can use what I call the anti-sales pitch. And I think the anti-sales pitch is brilliant because it basically says, these are all the reasons you shouldn't do it, and people like that. <laughs> they like it. Like if you say, look, this is difficult, right? There is a type of, because people do in their lives, in general, things that they want to do. So like someone who becomes a police officer is someone who at some level wants to become a police officer, right? Like I would never want to be a police officer. I'm not that guy. But my buddy Josh is becoming an Oakland PD, which I think he's insane. You know what I mean? But he wants to do that because he's a certain type of person. Right? A certain type of person is going to want to become a physicist. A certain type of person is going to want to become a piano teacher. People do in their lives something that they're passionate about. I know that the, you have chosen this dance with all of its complexity in part because you like that complexity. I mean, is that true? Is that true? Like you take pride in it. Right? You, 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 I mean, maybe that makes you left brain. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't want to make those sorts of, you know, this, this kind of broad brush statements. But the bottom line is you're doing this because there's complexity and you appreciate the complexity. Well, the people, out of the 10 people who come and one stays, you need, you need that person to be able to identify quickly because they like structure. That's why they're staying. Right? So they need to see quickly, oh, wow, this is for me. 
And then you'd be like, holy smoke, look at this structure. Look, look at what I can do here. Look at this, look at all this excellent, these contests. This is my kind of, of verb. Right? They need to be able to see that as soon as possible. And doing the anti-sales pitch is a great is a great way to do that. So structure. Is there any questions on that? I know it's simple, but is there any thoughts or anyone? All right. Um, marketing. Marketing. So last time I, I, I spoke mostly about social media marketing, and boy, has that changed the landscape. And, and the gentleman back, back over here, which we spoke earlier, uh, he talked about that. Say again, I, a conversation I had yesterday in the foyer, and he was saying how this, this woman in his group had done social media, and people had, had come from all over. And just a few here and there, but they had come, uh, which is what we're trying to do. So I wanna, I'm going to start with an example that I actually used three years ago, but it's for a different reason. Because I want, you, I want you to maybe start thinking a little bit differently about what's possible. So um, a few years ago, uh, Universal Studios uh, introduced their Harry Potter theme park. And uh, you know, of course, they could have spent millions on this launch. Uh, they actually chose not to. But of course, the launch was on a particular date. Right? There was one day where it would launch. And in preparation for that, they reached out to 10 bloggers, the 10 biggest bloggers in the Harry Potter niche and they invited them to an exclusive invite-only webinar. Okay. Uh, and, then they, and, and then they did the webinar. By the way, it started at midnight, uh, which gives you an idea of how they really tailored it to these bloggers who are, you know, they're young kids, right? They're up all night. Meanwhile, we go to, last night I was in bed at like 9.30. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I love my sleep. Someone said to me, are you a morning person or a night person? I'm like, I'm neither. Like, I want to go to bed early and sleep and wake whenever I wake up. But it's not a luxury I, can, I get all the time. But anyway, so they did this webinar, uh, which went from midnight until 1.30 in the morning, the day before the launch. Okay? And then the next day, the thing launches, and within 20, of course, these bloggers are tweeting about it and doing whatever they do. And within 24 hours, 350 million people uh, had heard about this launch. Right? The bottom line is, it was an event. It took place at a particular moment in time. There's only one launch. Okay? Everyone knows it's going to launch on this date. So it's a big deal. You either tune in or you don't. And you don't want to miss it. People don't want to miss it. So there's some real value in having an event-based marketing. So similar example, uh, when the Make-A-Wish Foundation literally brought San Francisco to a standstill to allow this six-year-old boy to be Batman for a day, some of you remember this campaign. Unbelievable. It happened on a particular day, right? The whole city came to a stop. They promoted it uh, with this hashtag, uh, SFBatKid, and ended up with like 200,000 or 20,000 photos and a half a million tweets, right? And by the way, their, their donations exploded, okay? Because they, they, it was an event. Right? Whenever you do an event, you, you pull more attention. People gravitate to a, an event that's something special. It's not just Tuesday night dancing. Okay, there's something more. There's a reason why it's more. Right? This is an event. So just a couple of other examples. Every year we have the Macy's Parade. Right? That's an event. People know it's coming. Right? And there's some promotion. All these people watch it because it's only going to happen once and you want to see it. Right? We have a Super Bowl every year. It's a big event. Right? These are all, uh, these are events, right? It's event-based marketing, and they call this, in, in marketing speak, they call these launch campaigns. Uh, and, and this is a really, so there's actually launch campaigns and drip campaigns, and so you, intuitively, I'm sure you, you already know. Dripping, like you, you email them every week, you stay in touch, you, you've got a newsletter, you do whatever you do, and there's a lot of value in that. But this idea of a launch campaign is the buzz in marketing. Uh, when Apple, Apple doesn't market their products, they launch their products, right? But when Star Wars launches a new movie, they don't market their movies, they launch the movie, right? All these are, are examples. People get excited about big events, right? People get inspired by big events. So this, there's, there's a value in doing these, uh, these launch campaigns. So, I want, to I want to give you another example because this might be easier to kind of parlay into the world that you're all a part of. So there's this company that, that sells wine jelly. Has anyone here had wine jelly? Have you really? Wow. I never even knew it existed. Um, but it's so obviously they make uh, jelly with wine. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now I'm pretty bright. I'm pretty bright at that. I work at it. And I'm a level three. <laughs> Anyway, 
So, because I never, anyway. So the wine, they make wine jelly. And, and, and at the beginning, uh, and it was, it was really cool because this, this was a result of a workshop that I did years ago. Um, so they, at the time, they were just selling uh, you know, jars, jars of jelly. And, and they had prices ranging uh, from $4, or you could buy six for like 20 bucks. And they sold them through retail, uh, retail stores. And so at that point, they're just a retail shelf vendor, right? There's, there's nothing, there's a million jars. You've all done the grocery store. There's a whole aisle, half an aisle, that's full of all these jars of jelly. They just have different labels. You don't really know anything that's different from one or the other. So what do they do? It's really a neat, a neat idea. And they come up with it on their own. They introduced a one-year, uh, two-day retreat in Napa. They're based in, in, in the Napa area, actually, up in Sonoma. And they did this two-day retreat where, and it was fancy, fancy, okay? And on the first day, they had a, a custom tour of like a private tour of a very fancy winery. And on the second day, they actually had a workshop where they made wine jelly themselves so everyone could take homemade <coughs> wine jelly home with them. And they had like three meals a day, all five-star stuff, and every single meal was paired with wine jelly, okay? Uh, and they charged uh, over $2,000 per person for this, okay? Now, Here's the thing, they didn't care if anybody bought it. They didn't care if anybody bought it. Because before, they were just a retail shelf vendor. But now, they're a hobby, right? They're an experience full of romance, good food. I mean, it's, it changed the frame of their business. And so they took this event that they do, and they put it on the labels of the jars, they put it on their website, Right? And so it changed the whole, how do you change the frame of square dancing? It's not just square dancing, right? It's a community, a fellowship and support and, and activities and, and maybe even trips, potentially. Right, like, I'm sorry? One dance. <laughs> but how do, you, how do you make it an experience? Right, there's this whole, there's this whole, you know, this kind of marketing theory. But you go back in time, two, three hundred years, and people were selling commodities for the most part. And then what you did with those commodities was up to you. But then, of course, uh, capitalism and democracy and uh, things evolve, and people do more cool, cool stuff because they're competing with each other. So then, after a while, they started selling products where they took commodities, they build something, they sell the commodity. Right? And then as time goes on, eventually people sell services, which is even a step above the product category. We're going to actually do it for you. And what are we at now? We're at marketing experiences, right? Like we are in an experience economy. This is the biggest shift that's happened in the last like five to seven years is where it's really picked up steam. And people who are into marketing, like they call it like a revolution of sorts. Uh, for the rest of us bystanders, we don't have to get quite that dramatic. But the bottom line is that we are in an experience economy. How do you make going to your square dancing events more of an experience? Right? It's something that only happens once. This event-based, this, this launch campaign strategy. Right? And I, at one time, I, I did a early on. This is 1989, or, or gosh, 2009. My apologies. Um, I graduated high school in 1989. <laughs> 46, 46, born 1971. Um, anyway, so I did this uh, educational workshop, and I, 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 and I was trying to make a video, because this was at a time when I was still trying to like make products to, to sell, I don't do that anymore, but, uh, so I, I was gonna do this, this six hour workshop, uh, six one hour presentations, and in the marketing, um, I said, uh, look, I, we're going to be videotaping this, which means you can't ask questions during the events. What is that? That's the anti-sales pitch, right? I just put an obstacle in front of them. Like, look, this is a, it's a six hours, and I was charging, I wasn't charging that much. I was charging like 100 bucks for the whole day. Uh, but there's going to be cameras there. I'm going to be trying to do the best job I can because I'm building a product with this, and you won't be able to ask questions. So I'm kind of making little, little obstacles in front of them, and people loved it because it was an experience. It's only happening once. People were curious about it. Wow, they're videotaping it. I gave them a reason to say, I'm going to go to that just because I want to see how it is, right? So that was an example that I had of doing something to make it more of an experience, more of a one-time event, right? And there's lots of, like, by the way, a contest is a one-time event, right? That's a perfect example. Like, the contest is next Thursday. Are you going to be there? 
It's only happening once, so you got to come. You're either going to be there, or you're going to miss it, right? Do more experience-oriented events is a way to get people excited uh, about coming. So there's another example, Laurel Pine. So brilliant. I met this. I had lunch with this lady once upon a time. Really, really genius. So she did something similar. She had an online event where she was selling premium foods like caviar and foie gras and truffle mushrooms and all these sorts of things. Uh, anyway, she, do you guys know that there's a trend out there called culinary tourism? Yes. Where basically like rich people, you know, go to some exotic place and you have like the best of everything. So she, and there's companies that will do these trips where you're basically, you buy it for wholesale, you sell it for retail. Like they'll, they'll take care of everything and you just mark it up to whatever you think the value is and you get to keep the difference. So she introduced this culinary, because it was in line with the premium foods that she's, that she's selling, she figured she had the same audience, right? And so she introduced this trip where they literally, they were in Italy for, for seven days, six nights, and they had like the best, the best of everything, all this incredibly fancy food. They stayed at the best hotels uh, in Italy. And uh, the price was 10,000 bucks for a person, and it didn't even include the flight to Rome. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But the people went for it. She, of course, she has tons of customers. And she, it's like, like, the, like the other guy. He, he, she didn't care if anyone bought it. Because the beauty is in being able to market it. We're doing something cool. We're doing something big. If people don't buy it, people don't buy it. Whatever. What have you lost? Right? What you've gained is the exposure and the fact that, hey, this is a cool community. They're doing cool things. Right? So it turns out she did end up selling. She had 20 spots. It added uh, a whole bunch to her, her revenue. The, the message is to, to think bigger about what's possible. Right? We, we don't just have to do dancing every Thursday, right? Or, or once a month, or whatever it is. I don't know like how often you do, you do these or whatever. Like, what else can we do? You guys are the leaders of these communities. What else can you do to make it more of an interesting, like, a more of a unique event, right? Like, something that they have a reason to go to. That can build a ton of energy. Uh, for folks that are giving it a try, and I want to give you one example, which which kind of will tell you why I, you know, I, I think about this stuff a lot because it's actually played a, a huge part of my life, and it, it wasn't even deliberate; it was almost an accident uh, when it happened. But I want to tell you that story because it'll, it's another, it's a good example, but it, it'll show you, you know, why this is such a huge concept for me. And it started on a Thursday evening uh, in 2007. And I was, I was struggling back then. I was, I was doing some marketing consulting, uh, but I, I wasn't. I mean, truthfully, I wasn't really doing uh, very well. And I, I, was, I was brainstorming. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was literally uh, sitting at my desk drinking a beer uh, on a Thursday evening, brainstorming on what I could do to get my business to, 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 to accelerate, right? Because was, it, wasn't going, it wasn't going that well. Uh, and so I thought, uh, at, at that evening, I thought, well, I should speak at a conference. And so I, I, I went to Google. You know, it seems like a foregone conclusion, but I'd never done it before. So it was totally new to me. So I went to Google and I searched for the phrase Internet Marketing Conference, which Internet Marketing is a term, the phrase is not as, as popular today. But back then, that was like the umbrella, like Internet Marketing was the big thing. So it turns out there actually was an Internet Marketing Conference, so of course it came up first in the search results, and I, I went to the website, this is what it looked like. And <laughs> I remember this like it was yesterday. So they were having a conference coming up in two months, but it was going to be in Stockholm, Sweden. And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> that's not really what I had in mind. Like, I'd never done anything like this, right? So it seemed insane. But, you know, across the top navigation thing, there was a, a tab that said speakers, and then there was this whole uh, description, and on the bottom there was another link that said submit a proposal. And so I clicked on that, so now I'm looking at this online form that I could fill out. And I was like, oh my gosh, should I fill this out? <laughs> So I, 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 had, I did have another beer, and I was like, what can I speak about, right? I, I mean, I didn't even know. So it turns out, in my business, the title of your program is actually quite important, which I didn't know at the, at the time. 
Uh, but I came up with a great title uh, that night. It was an awesome, awesome, awesome title. So I submitted a program. It was called Monetizing Trust, Leading Your Audience from Rapport to Revenue. Oh, it's a great title. It's a great title, right? But I didn't, I mean, I didn't expect, you know, I didn't expect to hear anything, right? And sure enough, it was a Thursday night when I did this, and I had, there was no email on Friday, there was nothing on Saturday, uh, there was nothing on Sunday. And then Monday morning, <laughs> So Monday morning I woke up and there was an email in my inbox which had come in at like two o'clock in the morning, which is the middle of the day in Sweden, saying, we're interested in your program. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is the first thing in the morning. <laughs> I was like, this is unbelievable. It's really, you know, it's funny. You ever look back on your life and you realize like little things that happened that just ended up making a huge difference? We all have that. Like, you know, people like, in the speaking business, people often like, so there's a big distinction between like Tony Robbins type speakers and I, I do keynote. Like 90% of speakers do like what I call platform speaking where they're always selling something. There's always something for sale. Uh, in keynote, there's never, I, I, mean, I have nothing to sell. You know, you get paid to speak and that's, that's, that's all you do. Um, but anyway, like at the time, to the opportunity to go to, to, it was just completely out of my frame of reference. I didn't even think that, that was possible. Uh, and, and sure enough, now they're, they're interested. So I started, you know, there, there was emails back and forth, and believe me, this is, I'm simplifying the story, there's a lot of back and forth. But sure enough, after a few months, I ended up in Stockholm, and I spoke at this conference, which was an unbelievable thing for me. But Here's the important part. This is the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this, this, uh, this story up. So, you know what they say? This is incredible. I met the guys, obviously, the organizers, and the one main guy, his name is Leonard Svanberg. It's a classic Swedish name. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, one of the main reasons we hired you is because you're an American from Silicon Valley. <laughs> really? Really? Seven million people are in that category. <laughs> Being an American from Silicon Valley is not a major thing if you're an American in Silicon Valley. <laughs> it turns out if you go to Sweden, that's a big deal. Who knew, right? You know what else they told me? They told me I was the only American who submitted a proposal. Really. <laughs> so by going to the other side of the world, I eliminated my competition. <laughs> I mean, I, it's not like it reduced, like there, it wasn't there. Like it was just me. I couldn't believe it. And, and then, I mean seriously, like I got credibility for speaking in Sweden. And then when I got home, I got credibility at home. I got, I was, I got there because because I was an American from Silicon Valley, which is insane to me. Right? So I got credibility there. I went there, I spoke, and then I came back, and now I become the guy who spoke in Sweden. <laughs> like I got credibility in both directions, right? I, the whole thing. I mean, so I was sold. Like I, I, could, I, I couldn't believe it. So I, I made this, this, these cheesy envelopes <laughs> that, that uh, I don't have these anymore. But I, I took this marketing and I sent it all over the world because I was like. I didn't have any competition. And my point is, by the way, that because this this ended up translating. Like, I spoke everywhere. I mean, it would it was unbelievable. Like you just gotta get your. I spoke like all over the world. I spoke in. I mean, that's when this whole thing started. Like I put all this energy into getting these crazy international gigs because it was building my credibility back home. Like the, the whole, that was my hack. That was my trick. That, that's how I got. That's how this whole thing happened. Like I was dying on the vine. I wasn't really making any money at the beginning. But then I started going to Dubai, and you know, I'm nothing special. You know, the hardest place to get paid to speak is in your own backyard. Meanwhile, you go to Dubai, you're something special. Are you kidding? You should try it. <laughs> I mean, it's really true. So when you when you think bigger, right? That's that's this whole that's my whole message to you is when you think bigger, when you do something big. I don't you know, I don't know how realistic doing something big is. Doing a trip, maybe. Doing something where you do something different, like right? maybe you've been doing it kind of the same, 
for a few years or maybe even a decade or two. Like, how can we change it up? Do something bigger. Do, maybe do a trip, do a field trip, do something intent, like, hey, we're going to do a, a three-day intensive where you're going to be dancing for four hours a day for three days in a row and cost some money. Just something. It doesn't matter if people buy it. It doesn't matter if people buy it. And the point is for you to be doing it so the awareness grows. So when people come, they're like, wow, there's more to this than what meets the eye. And look at all this structure. Look at this menu. I mean, there's a contest in a month. And they're doing this, this other event that I can participate in. And there seemed like there were nice people there. Right? Like, this is something where, because I think, do you guys remember Phyllis? My, my friend Phyllis, I, I mentioned her three years ago. She's a friend of mine, a uh, 65-year-old Jewish lady. I love her to death. She, I, I lived above her for a, a, a short time. And, and she's, I, I took her, because again, surprise, surprise, Barry Clasper in his generosity came to the Bay Area and he was calling an event and so he invited me to attend. So I actually went to an event uh, that he was, he was featured at and I brought Phyllis with me. And I have to tell you, it was a no-go. <laughs> Phyllis, she's one of these, and I didn't know this going in, but some people just can't hear the music. Just the basic. They're, all, they're out there, right? I, I learned this in the <laughs> So, and it's really, I, I, honestly, there's a part of it that I think is a little bit sad, because it's, if you don't notice that, that there's a lot in life, because I always notice the beat in anything. Sometimes the music's very distant in my my. my, my I, f I feel my body moving to it, and it, it gets me this energy that comes from the music. And I think if you don't hear the beat, you probably miss out on all that, which I think is sad. But anyway, she, she, we tried it, and it didn't work. But, but the bottom line is that Phyllis is still a perfect target market for what you've, you all are doing, because she's a wonderful lady, and, and she just wants to get out and do things. It turns out she's happier if she's like in the forest or swimming. Okay. Like that's what she really likes, and trying to dance was very stressful for her. She didn't want any part of it. But there's, so she's in the nine out of ten, or whatever that number is, right? But we gotta find the one, and and sometimes the one comes, and they don't see that they are the one. They don't see that hey, this is something I could do. This is they they, they don't they miss it for one reason or another, right? And if you add more structure and you do more special events and you add that to your marketing, when those folks show up they will see what, what, it, what it's a part of. And a lot of it is just getting out of your comfort zone and trying something new, because that's where the magic happens. Right? It, it really is. It doesn't matter what age we are. Uh, and by the way, your comfort zone does not stay stable as we age. It slowly retracts. And that's what happens as we get older. There's things that we were comfortable doing, and now it's been seven years since I've done it, and so your, your comfort zone, so we have to fight just to keep our comfort zone where it is, now, much less actually grow it. And growing it is all about trying new things, trying new things, things that are outside your comfort zone, and see if we can uh, get some energy. So that's, that's my message, right? My message is, is to embrace the role that you have as being leaders in your community. Uh, and again, the three things that I think are really really pivotal to that is, is the kindness and that welcoming energy and just letting people know that you are welcome here. We can help you, we can show you the way, and we can give you an activity which will give you the social life that you're craving. I think that's the biggest thing uh, that people are searching for. Structure is a great way to do it, just to let people see what they're a part of, and what they can do, where they're starting, what, where's the starting line, and where's the finish line, right, and what's involved. Uh, and then doing some marketing and doing some events along the way. So I, I, I truly hope, uh, you know, this is a, a different program than I did three years ago. Three years ago was much more social media tactical. This was a little more broad brush, but I, I, I do sincerely hope that there's there's something in there you can you can chew and, and bite into and, and work with. And I'm, I'm certainly very, very grateful uh, to, to, to Barry and to Dana and, and, and to all of you, frankly, for your, for your time. So thank you so much.